Greetings, travelers. Welcome back to Tales from the Enchanted Forest podcast with your hosts, Fox and Sparrow. Hiya, travelers. Welcome back. We're here today with another interesting tale that Fox has found. But before we get to that, it's been a while and I just want to catch up a bit with Fox and we're going to talk a little bit about things that we have been into lately. So, Fox, what's up with you? What are your current obsessions? I like how we say that as if we haven't just been talking for an hour and a half before we even started recording. Well, to be fair, I haven't heard <laughs> what you're currently into. We talked about like how your family's doing. We talked about how my family's doing. We talked about our jobs, but we have not talked about our current obsessions, which let's be real. We both just really want to talk to to each other about. So my current obsession is Iron Flame. So for those of you who don't know, which I think Sparrow, I don't think you're a, a fourth wing fan. No. So basically, there are two books that Book Talk has been crazy about recently. And the most popular one has always been A Court of Thorns and Roses. Um, and that whole series with Sarah J. Mass. But... The latest one that kind of came out of nowhere and took everything by storm was Fourth Wing. And the setting is in kind of a fantasy world where there is a writer's quadrant, a scribe quadrant, and like all these other different places where people get put into while they're um, in like school age, I guess, like 17, 18, like when they're leaving high school. And the writer's quadrant is Dragon Riders. So you enter kind of this school setting I guess where you have classes and you have to learn to be a dragon rider and then at the end of or the mid of your first year a dragon has to pick you oh my gosh and it follows Violet Sorengale and kind of her journey as a dragon rider figuring out you know the whole war situation because there's always a war of course um and the shadow daddy the guy who's really (laughs) mysterious there's always one of those but mm-hmm. Iron Flame has just come out and I managed to snag an audiobook copy of it because I listened to it. I didn't read it. Um, so I was very excited to get that. And I am about, I think, 30% through it. And so far, I have more questions than answers, let's just say. But that's been my current obsession. Oh, it just came out too. I was so excited. I think I remember seeing you talk about it on your Instagram. You're like, no one spoil me. I need to watch this or listen to this. It's because people are already like, I don't understand how people have already read the book. It came out so recently, but people have already finished reading it and they've already started making memes and TikToks. And a lot of people don't put spoiler warning. They just go straight into the spoiler. And I followed a whole bunch of uh, fourth wing accounts and stuff when I finished the first book because I had, again, lots of theories and questions that I wanted a community to discuss that with. Because I feel like when I'm reading, I don't really want to talk about it with people in real life. I want to look at videos of people analyzing <laughs> it. it down. Or, well, breaking it down, but also like fun meme videos and people making fun of the book and stuff like that as well. Like I like everything. I also like confirmation bias. I like to see that other people have the same ideas as me to be like, I was correct. I was right. But anyway, so people aren't tagging their stuff. And so it's really annoying because I've had to stay off of some sites. Um just to make sure I don't see anything. And I think I've only seen one spoiler so far. Mm. So I'm trying to just get through this book as quickly as possible. So that's my current obsession. Hear that, travelers? Don't send us spoiler stuff. And if I think you're welcome to send old memes of this book. Yeah. Yeah, I love the old memes. Perfectly fine with the old memes. Send the old memes our way. And uh, remember to mark your stuff a spoiler if it applies. Also... I feel like whenever anything is really widely enjoyed by a book talk community or any kind of book community of predominantly females, you always have people who are so critical and they're just, I find people are very angry about the fact that a book like this or another book like let's say A Court of Thorns and Roses got so much popularity or they ha- it has so much hype because it's what some people call low literature, right? It's just meant to be read for fun. There's no big moral reveal at the end where you realize something intrinsic about mankind or humanity. It's a fun book to read, okay? I don't believe that every book you need has to be for learning. I don't believe that every book you read has to, you know, help you in some way or give you something besides enjoyment. And at the moment, because I'm working so much, I enjoy listening to stuff or reading stuff just to enjoy it. I don't need Mm -hmm. to read, you know, The Great Gatsby and be making class commentary 
when I could just read something for fun. And sure, I mean, a book like this, like Fourth Wing, I'm not saying it doesn't have anything, because obviously a lot of these books are based on mythology, they're based on um, obviously class struggles and racism, stuff like that all the time. But sometimes I just want to read my silly dragon book in peace and talk to other people about my silly dragon book, okay? Mm Mm-hmm. So, because I've just been seeing a lot of that where people are like, this is what book talk enjoys. And I'm like, yeah, this is what book talk enjoys. Yeah. Let people enjoy things. I know people who have like always have two books on going at any given time. One that's like their literature, the deep insights and just um, mm-hmm. gives the answers to all mankind. <laughs> and then they have the one that's <laughs> trash that they read. Then they go through really quickly. But then they'll always have the other one that they pick up once in a while when they have the capacity for it. Yeah. Um, it's just it takes more energy sometimes to read a book that's um kind of deep like that or if you're not putting all your energy into it that's necessary that you're not really getting anything out of it that you're looking for no and i think this whole myth that everything you do in terms of reading has to be for some kind of advance- advancement is wrong this is why i think kids don't like reading in school is because we make them read things that aren't enjoyable to them and that isn't relatable that isn't fun that doesn't teach them a love for reading obviously i am a big fan of teaching literature because i teach mm. literature <laughs> but i think that it should always be done in conjunction and with understanding of what your class needs so i do believe in teaching things like macbeth and teaching things like animal farm and teaching stuff that's hard to read for kids but I also believe that you know you should do book studies and you should do independent reading projects so kids can read things that they actually like as well because it shouldn't always have to be this boring topic of well if I'm going to read it has to be a classic no it doesn't it could be anything so what are you into Sparrow is it going to lead to a rant over the summer, my brother introduced me to this YouTube channel, and I was like, mm, I guess I'll, I'll watch a little bit of it. And then I like completely binged everything on their, <laughs> their channel within like a couple weeks. So oh, uh, yeah. a little while ago, they uploaded a new season, as it were, and I waited for it all to finish, and then I binged it in the, the last recent while. So the channel's called um, Jetlagged the Game, and okay. the, the premise of the show is that it's these three guys, and then they always have one guest person per season. They come up with this, like, game that they have to play, and it co- covers the course of a season, which are, like, I don't know, six, eight episodes each, which are, like, 20 minutes or whatever in length. And But the challenges are, like, stuff that usually gets them to have to travel from country to country or, like, state to state. So, like, the first one was who could travel the globe within 72 hours but they had restrictions in terms of like what they could pay um, on like prices for flights. And if they ran out of the game coins, they had to do these ridiculous challenges to earn game coins so they could go further and get like the next flight. So that was like the first season they did that, like travel around the, the globe. Uh, they did connect four across the U.S. states. So they had to try and get like four states in a row that was either their colors. And then they had to do challenges when they got there and stuff. Um, their most recent one. This is like the second time they're doing it. This the mm-hmm. season was uh, Euro tag. So they all started in the same point in Europe. And then the one person had to run away and try and get to their specific city. So the first guy was trying to get to, I think, Switzerland. And uh, he had 30 minute head start. So but the chasers could watch where the person was going on their phones because they had their phone tracker on. Um, but oh. the runner had no idea. And so the runner has to do these challenges again to earn game coins, but to take uh, the the trains while trying to outsmart the chasers who can see where they are. But the chasers are trying to predict what train they're going to hop on. <laughs> so Jeez. it's um it's quite chaotic and fun. And uh, I know earlier uh, in the month you were having some struggles mm-hmm. with the with germany's train system and while you were complaining to me literally in the show they were just like all their plans were getting ruined because the german trains were just not running properly (laughs) it's the deutsche bahn it it was not running like so many plans were messed up because they're like great we're gonna take this train we'll cut them off here at this city and they're like what what does that mean can we speak german nope it just means canceled Yep, your train's canceled. Good luck. But the good part about that is that you can take almost any other means of um, transport to get to your final destination as long as it's before, I think, maybe 10 or 12 o'clock the next day. So 
Yeah. They could have just hopped onto anything. Well, there's all these restrictions on it. Um, They could take any form of transit, but then it's like they're trying to cut off the other person before they move cities and stuff. Ah, yes. Okay. So they have to follow that It's because it's a chase. I think you would like it. I would recommend giving a shot. It's jet-legged, the game. It's just a really fun um, kind of travel gamified version. It's great. It sounds a lot like um, not Amazing Race, but there's a British show because I spent a lot of time watching British show with my very British husband. Um, (laughs) I think it's called The Watchers or The Chasers or something like that, where you are trying to avoid being caught by them, but they have access to cell phones and they can like track people who are close to you to see if they're getting any calls or if a call goes out, let's say from your mom's house, they're going to be, they're going to try and figure out where that call mm-hmm. went to. So it's very similar. And I've always thought that premise was so cool being like, because it's, it's honestly like you're being chased in real life and you have to get to a certain point to get rescued or evacuated before they can stop you. Yeah. Well, and so they've I only like done, like that. they've only done tag twice and it's the mm-hmm. only time they've repeated a game. Um, they did um, uh, capture the flag in Japan. They did um, a oh. board game on New Zealand. They come up with all these really creative ways to just do really fun travel challenges. And it's it's really fun. If you like traveling, um, it's a really fun uh, show to watch for that. Anyways, that's what I've been into. I put it on my, my watch list because I think that might be one of those things that it's a good thing to watch when you have lots of downtime. Yeah, so hopefully in the future when we ca- talk about what we're currently into, you can tell me how you're <laughs> I'll be into like, I'm jet-lagged. into jet lagged. <laughs> Yay! Like, Sparrow, have you heard of this cool thing I discovered? It's called jet lagged. Um, oh my gosh. I think you'd really enjoy it. <laughs> oh my gosh, that sounds cool. What's it called? Le- bet lagged? Bet lagged? That's it? Jet lagged. <laughs> okay, guys. So those are all of the things we are into, and something we hope you are into is hearing this next story. Mm hmm. So this story comes from the Appalachians, and it is specifically from the Cherokee First Nations. Snuggle in and get ready for the thrilling story behind the nightmare creature, the story behind the wampus cat. In non-native cultures, obviously the wampus cat, the whistling wampus, or the galley wampus, as it is called, is a half-dog, half-cat creature that lurks in dark places and pierces the hearts and souls of those that come across it. However, this story is probably the origin story of this cat, but it's a little bit different. So it is a story of running deer. So before we run out of time, here is our story for today, Dear Travelers. It all began, as some stories do, with an evil spirit called Iwa, the spirit of madness. It had appeared suddenly and began terrorizing Cherokee lands. This creature could drive a man mad with a single glance, and it feasted on the nightmares of children. No one knew what to do, and in a meeting with the village leaders and war chiefs, the shamans advised the others that sending out their bravest men to hunt the spirit would end in disaster. All of their men would go mad and leave the villages unprotected. In the end, they decided to just send one man, their bravest soldier and the strongest, fastest, and most respected amongst them all. Standing Bear, or Great Fellow, depending on the version of the story you read. <sighs> Not gonna lie, when you said that sending the brave men would end in disaster, I thought you were going to follow up with, and so they sent this woman in, and she kicked <laughs> butt. You know, kind of one of those moments where it, like, it's like, yeah. I am no man. <laughs> or it's like, no one of man born can hurt me. Wait, no, that's not right. Wait, no, sorry. That's not, wait, what was it? A woman born. It's like the Macbeth moment of... No one of woman born can hurt me. And Macduff goes, I wasn't born from a woman. And everyone is very confused until they learn that he was born from a woman, but it was a C-section. But yes, it's one of those iconic moments. I was really expecting that. And you're like, and then they still sent a dude. I was like, cool. Yes, but they sent a single dude for the stealth mission. But it's like the rule of ninjas. If you have a bunch of ninjas around, they're going to be useless. If you send one ninja in, it's going to be super effective. (laughs) <laughs> you know they're the conservation yes. ninjutsu it's a trope basically well this is also i think a common trope where it's the wording exactly of a spell or a prophecy or a curse and to get around it you have to go around it so if it's like no man can hurt me it's like well i'm a woman so i can hurt you <laughs> and i won't spoil it but it's something in aragon is quite similar to this where he does something 
that bypass is a curse. Well, if you know, you know. Yeah, if you know, you know. And if you don't know, you should read Aragon before the next book comes out, which I think it already did anyway. So. So go read it. (laughs) Standing Bear accepted the proposition without hesitation. And as he set off, he was honored with the finest weapons from the war chiefs and blessings of protection from the shamans. His last goodbye was to his wife, Running Deer. Little did she know that this would be the last time she saw her husband as he was. Dun, dun, dun. Weeks passed and no one heard any news from Standing Bear. They all thought the worst, until one night when he came running back to their camp. The powerful man was no more, and in his place stood a madman, clawing at his eyes and fighting unknown horrors. Running Deer met her husband, but one look and she knew that he was lost to her forever. She knew that one day he would eventually recover enough to help pick berries and play with the children, but he would never fully be himself again. This meant that he was as good as dead to her as a husband. It's actually really sad. It is. It's one of those things where it's almost worse that he's come back alive like this because you have to see him for the rest of your life, knowing that he's not, he either doesn't recognize you or he doesn't know who you are. And so you have to live with him being alive as opposed to just being able to fully mourn him, if that makes sense. Yeah, it's like you're seeing like the ghost or the shell of him. And Mm -hmm. yeah. And this is actually something that's that's talked about a lot in like books and movies and memoirs and stuff that have people who um, have family members that come back from war or come back in a different state and they come back such a different version of themselves that you have such a hard time recognizing them. And that's something that you have to get through either together or you have to let them heal on their own. But it's it's such a hard thing, I think. Mm hmm. Standing before her was her husband in appearance, but also a madman who was not hers anymore. She wanted her revenge at any cost, so she went to the shamans and asked to go after Iwa. The others understood her grief, and even though they thought her mission futile, they sent her anyway with their blessings. They also gifted her a mask of a bobcat's face, and told her that the only adversary to Iwa was the bobcat. In order to defeat him, she would need to sneak up on him and cover her scent. Iwa might think she was the bobcat, or the bobcat spirit might come to her aid. Either way, it was her best hope of survival. Hey, here it is. Our girl is stepping in to save the day. Uh, And just as a side note, though, if he is in a state where he can't really take care of the kids or anything, who's going to take care of the kids? Like, if she's going off on her adventuring to avenge him? I don't think they have kids. I think... Oh. um, I... I think when it says like picking berries and play with the children, I think that means in like a very broad term of like with the rest of the children of the village. I see. I misunderstood. I thought this indicated they had children and like he wouldn't. I don't even be. Think so. Well, I mean, in the in the text, it does say that she knew that he would recover enough to help pick berries with the children and the old women. So I think that it. I thought that meant that you know, with other people in the village. But it could mean they're kids. I don't know. Okay, well, I'll just assume they don't have kids, and I meant this is the general kids. But when I saw you say play with children Mm -hmm. earlier, I thought it was, like, that was even more gut-wrenching to me. I'm like, oh, my gosh. Their kids are going to have to see him like this. Ugh. Yeah. I mean, it might. It might mean that they have kids. I don't know. In that case, my point stands. (laughs) Who's taking care of the kids? (laughs) I think it's to mean the more general, like, village kids, but it could have meant their kids. Either way, I think it's a very community-focused group so they would take care of each other that's cool but again it's so heartbreaking and i feel like she knows that this mission is going to be very dangerous she might not win she might not you know save anyone so it's almost like it's the only thing she can do yeah i feel for her running deer took the items and kissed her former husband on the forehead before leaving to get their revenge She knew the woods well and made her way through them to find signs of where the demon was lurking. She traveled for many days without luck, until one night she heard something sulking by the stream. Running Deer crept slowly and waited, but to her surprise, a mischievous fox was the one to dart from behind her and scare her. However, instead of turning back, Running Deer followed her gut feeling and continued down to the stream. There, she found footprints and her former husband's breastplate. Her blood ran cold. She knew this was it. She followed the tracks up to where she finally spotted the hulking spirit of Iwa. It was hunched over its back to her as it drank from a spring. 
Running Deer donned her mask and sprang at the creature. The spirit spun, and when it saw the cat mask, it began tearing at itself. The spirit of the mountain cat had turned Iwaz and Sandy back onto itself, and the creature howled in pain as it clawed at its own eyes. This is truly the cat's greatest power, the power of a Uno reverse card. <laughs> Does this make her the first cat woman? Oh my gosh, I think it is. Interesting. Oh my God. I love it. I just enjoy the fact that this the only thing that scares this, you know, terrifying nightmare demon is a cat, a bobcat. As Iwa lurched and tumbled, Running Deer bolted, running straight back to her camp. As she ran, she sang a quiet song to herself, one of grief and joy. The demon was banished, but she had lost her husband forever. The leaders celebrated Running Deer's arrival and gave her the names Spirit Talker and Home Protector. Some say to this day, Running Deer inhabits the Wampus Cat, continuing her mission of protecting her land and people. And that is the story of Running Deer and Iwa. I like that one. It's cute. I I do wonder, though, if maybe she was slightly disappointed. Like, some people kind of go on those suicide missions, so I was wondering if maybe she was actually kind of hoping to kind of join her husband um, mm. in a way. But I'm sure she's more happy with the with the outcome and the fact that this this thing will not actually terrorize her village anymore. But I wonder how she views all that now. Well, I think at the end of the story, in some of the versions I've read, I think the implication is that she kind of takes on the role of the protector. And so she does want, like, she's the one that goes around night to night, kind of like Buffy the Vampire mm. Slayer, where she just patrols. Oh, so it's okay. kind of like that role where she has a very meaningful and, um, you know, a meaningful role within the community where she's actively helping other people avoid the same fate that she had or the same fate that her husband had. So, I mean, to some people, I think that is enough to live off of. I don't know. I mean, if I was in the same situation, and obviously I can never be in the same situation, but I'm just trying to imagine, you know, what life would be like with my husband going mad or my husband, you know, having something done to him that makes him go insane to this extent. Not saying a demon, because I don't think there are demons in this world, but I think it would be very difficult to, to live alongside that knowing that there wasn't anything you could do or anything you could do to help them. I feel like it would be very grief stricken. So to have her have a purpose, have her find something that is, you know, an accomplishment, something that helps her village, something that makes her useful and makes her feel useful and valued. I feel like those are all things that are important. So if she gets that from being the protector, great. Maybe she gets it from something else, like a different something. Maybe that comes from a different source, but I think it's one of those stories where it's about revenge. She got her revenge and now she's become kind of this legendary figure, which is maybe the Wampus Cat, but, and, you know, we would call it the Wampus Cat, but maybe it was known as something else. But she's this spirit talker and home protector. And Cat Lady. And Cat Lady, the Cat Woman. <laughs> Still a better arc than Cat Woman and Batman? I mean, it's been a while since I've seen Batman. Uh... The, the Catwoman arc, so I don't really remember hers all too well. I just Not remember, sure it's better. I really like the Harley Quinn series. Oh, yeah, I never so saw that I'm a big fan one. of Poison Ivy now. I mean, I was always a big fan of Poison Ivy. Have you? Did you see her in the live action? But I did not see her in live. I know Poison Ivy's general thing, and I think I've always appreciated how she was started out as a villain. She's like, oh, my gosh, I got to, like, wipe out humanity or whatever so that, like, plants can grow. And now she's kind of, like because of how values have changed over the years, she's kind of now an anti-hero because like, yeah, <laughs> we actually do need to take care of the earth, but she's done nothing different. She's just like... The same person she was before. <laughs> Anyways, that's all I know about Poison Ivy, and I appreciate her for that. Um, but I've not watched the, 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 the show. But yeah, um, but you did call her like a spirit talker, right? That was one of her titles? Yes. So they called she her. Really talked to the spirit. It seemed like more. She just kind of had a jump scare, and then it was over. Um, I don't know. I think the implication is that there was something about the mask that they gave her that was magical in itself. But mm. she, like, I feel like the implication is kind of that the the mountain cat or the bobcat came to her aid and became her spirit, and so she was able to channel that spirit and use it against the Iwa. It could have been that it was the mask itself that did it. But either way, I think the the title Spirit Talker mainly talks about the fact that, mainly is alluding to the fact that she um, was able to call upon 
the bobcat spirit. Mm. I see. Not so much that she was talking to the Ewa or anything like that. Gotcha. And then home protector, I think that one is self-evident. What I thought was quite interesting about this story was the mention of the fox, because it seems so random. Yeah. It's just right there in the middle. And usually stories like this, when I've read other, you know, native stories, when we did the creation story, when we've done some shorter stories um, from, I think there was a couple star stories we covered at one point in a smaller series, but I find they're always quite to the point and everything has some kind of purpose in the story. So for the story to include the fox, I almost think that it was instead of playing the role of, you know, the mischievous fox, instead of playing the role as the trickster fox, which we see quite often, um, I think it was almost like a protector fox because foxes are very picky depending on which tribe you look at, which native group you look at, which even which country you're looking at, to be honest. Mm-hmm. Um, foxes are one of those animals where some places see them as a benevolent spirit that is, you know, there to give you aid and guidance. Some places see it as an aggressive spirit. Some people see it almost like a trickster where it's there to almost humiliate the people who are doing something wrong or the animals who are doing something wrong and, you know, shame them a little bit. Specifically, I think in England, we see a lot of the trickster fox, but not so much in native cultures. I think that's more the coyote, just like we have the spider and the coyote in some African places. Um, Like I think we did the coyote in the spring um, I think we also had the the turtle um, in a more recent episode in the Ni- yes. Nigeria. Yes, Nigeria had the turtle, and I think no matter so depending on where you are in the world, I think animals hold different meanings, and so it's hard to say if the fox here was supposed to be a mischievous fox and it was trying to get her to you know cry out and then alert the demon, or if it was helping guide her towards where the demon was. But it's just interesting that it's there and trying to figure out what the purpose of the fox was. Obviously, I have a very special interest in foxes. <laughs> yes. Here in the Enchanted Forest, the fox is your animal companion and host of the, the podcast. <laughs> in general, I think I picked the story just because I wanted something a little bit darker for the darker months of the year. But I also wanted something that was hopeful and light at the end. So we always have grief. We always have these dark months and these dark seasons. But they always come to a close. And we always have something to look forward to in the spring. And I feel like that's always been something that I... It's like a mantra I say to myself sometimes. Is that, you know, this too shall pass. So these dark days will soon be over. And and I mean literally these dark days. Because it's 4 o'clock and it's pitch black outside oh my goodness soon yes the- <laughs> we will have bright days again and then we can complain about the heat yes but before the time changes and everything we'll have a festive season so we might have some holiday themed episodes coming up so hopefully that will brighten us up in the dark times and it's something to look forward to but those stories will have to wait until next time However, until then, if you want to see the show summary, notes, or anything else, please check out our website, talesfromtheenchantedforest.com. It is the most reliable place to find us, but we are still on Twitter, also known as X, on Instagram, TikTok, Mastodon, Blue Sky, literally anywhere. We are on From Enchanted or Tales from the Enchanted Forest podcast. If you are old school like Sparrow, you can always email us at Tales from the Enchanted Forest. And remember, travelers, if you enjoyed what you heard today and what we do here, please give us a review on whatever platform you use to listen to your podcasts. It helps the podcast grow and reach new travelers to join us on these adventures. And remember, there's always a place for you in the Enchanted Forest. Mm-hmm.